Section 22 of Three Science Fiction Novellas by Lee Brackett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2 of The Vanishing Venusians They made good time. The clean air acted as a tonic, and hope spurred them on. The tunnel sloped upward rather sharply, and presently Harker heard water, a low thunderous murmur as of an underground river up ahead. It was utterly dark, but the smooth channel of stone was easy to follow. Sim said, "'Isn't that a light up ahead?' "'Yeah,' said Harker, "'some kind of phosphorescence. "'I don't like that river. "'It may stop us.' They went on in silence. The glow grew stronger, the air more damp. Patches of phosphorescent lichen appeared on the walls, glimmering with dim jewel tones like an unhealthy rainbow. The roar of the water was very loud. They came upon it suddenly. It flowed across the course of their tunnel in a broad channel worn deep into the rock so that its level had fallen below its old place and left the tunnel dry. It was a wide river, slow and majestic. Lichen spangled the roof and walls, reflecting in dull glints of color from the water. Overhead there was a black chimney going up through the rock, and the cool draft came from there with almost hurricane force, much of which was dissipated in the main river tunnel. Harker judged there was a cliff formation on the surface that siphoned the wind downward. The chimney was completely inaccessible. Harker said, I guess we'll have to go upstream, along the side. The rock was eroded enough to make that possible, showing wide ledges at different levels. McLaren said, What if this river doesn't come from the surface? What if it starts from an underground source? You stuck your neck out, Harker said. Come on. They started. After a while, tumbling like porpoises in the black water, the golden creature swam by and saw the men, and stopped, and swam back again. They were not very large, the largest about the size of a twelve-year-old child. Their bodies were anthropoid, but adapted to swimming with shimmering webs. They glowed with a golden light, phosphorescent like the lichen, and their eyes were lidless and black, like one huge spreading pupil. Their faces were incredible, Harker could remember, faintly, the golden dandelions that grew on the lawn in summer. The heads and faces of the swimmers were like that, covered with streaming petals that seemed to have independent movements, as though they were sensory organs as well as decoration. Harker said, For cripe's sake, what are they? They look like flowers, McLaren said. They look more like fish, the black man said. Harker laughed. I'll bet they're both. I'll bet they're planties that grew where they had to be amphibious. The colonists had shortened the plant animal to planimal, and then just plany. I've seen gimmicks in the swamps that weren't so far away from these, but geez, get the eyes on them. They look human. The shape's human too, almost, McLaren shivered. I wish they wouldn't look at us that way. Sim said, As long as they just look, I'm not going to worry. They didn't. They started to close in below the men, swimming effortlessly against the current. Some of them began to clamber out on the low edge behind them. They were agile and graceful. There was something unpleasantly childlike about them. There were fifteen or twenty of them, and they reminded Harker of a gang of mischievous kids. Only the mischief had a queer, soulless quality of malevolence. Harker led the way faster along the ledge. His knife was drawn and he carried a short spear in his right hand. The tone of the river changed. The channel broadened, and up ahead Harker saw that the cavern ended in a vast, shadowy place, the water spreading into a dark lake, spilling slowly out over a low, wide lip of rock. More of the shining child things were playing there. They joined their fellows, closing the ring tighter around the three men. I don't like this, McLaren said. 
if they'd only make a noise. They did, suddenly, a shrill tittering like a blasphemy of childish laughter. Their eyes shone. They rushed in, running wetly along the ledge, reaching up out of the water to claw at ankles, laughing. Inside his tough flat belly, Harker's guts turned over. McLaren yelled and kicked. Claws raked his ankle, spiny, needle-sharp things like thorns. Sim ran his spear clean through a golden breast. There were no bones in it. The body was light and membranous, and the blood that ran out was sticky and greenish, like sap. Harker kicked two of the things back in the river, swung his spear like a ball bat, and knocked two more off the ledge. They were unbelievably light, and shouted, Up there, that high ledge. I don't think they can climb that. He thrust McLaren bodily past him and helped Sim fight a rear-guard action while they all climbed a rotten and difficult transit. McLaren crouched at the top and hurled chunks of stone at the attackers. There was a great crack running up and clear across the cavern roof, scar of some ancient earthquake. Presently a small slide started. Okay, Harker panted. Quit before you bring the roof down. They can't follow us. The planes were equipped for swimming, not climbing. They clawed angrily and slipped back, and then retreated sullenly to the water. Abruptly they seized the body with Sim's spear through it and devoured it, quarreling fiercely over it. McLaren leaned over the edge and was sick. Harker didn't feel so good himself. He got up and went on. Sim helped McLaren, whose ankle was bleeding badly. This higher ledge angled up and around the wall of the Great Lake Cavern. It was cooler and drier here, and the lichens thinned out, and vanished, leaving total darkness. Harker yelled once. From the echo of his voice the place was enormous. Down below, in the black water, golden bodies streaked like comets in an ebon universe, going somewhere, going fast. Harker felt his way carefully along. His skin twitched with a nervous impulse of danger, a sense of something unseen, unnatural, and wicked. Sim said, I hear something. They stopped. The blind air lay heavy with a subtle fragrance. "'spicy and pleasant, yet somehow unclean. "'The water sighed lazily far below. "'Somewhere ahead was a smooth, rushing noise "'which Harker guessed was the river inlet. "'But none of that was what Sim meant. "'He meant the rippling, rustling sound "'that came from everywhere in the cavern. "'The black surface of the lake was dotted now "'with spots of burning phosphorescent color, "'trailing fiery wakes.' The spots grew swiftly, coming nearer, and became carpets of flowers, scarlet and blue and gold and purple, floating fields of them, and towed by shining swimmers. "'My God,' said Harker softly, "'how big are they?' "'Enough to make three of me.' Sim was a big man. "'Those little ones were children, all right. They went on and got their papas. Oh, Lord!' The swimmers were very like the smaller ones that had attacked them by the river, except for their giant size. They were not cumbersome. They were magnificent, supple-limbed and light. Their membranes had spread into great shining wings, each rib tipped with fire. Only the golden dandelion heads had changed. They had shed their petals. Their adult heads were crowned with flat, coiled growths having the poisonous and filthy beauty of fungus, and their faces were the faces of men. For the first time since childhood, Harker was cold. The fields of burning flowers were swirled together at the base of the cliff. The golden giants cried out suddenly, a sonorous belling note, and the water was churned to blazing foam as thousands of flower-like bodies broke away and started up the cliff on suckered, spidery legs. It didn't look as though it were worth trying, but Harker said, 
Let's get the hell on. There was a faint light now from the army below. He began to run along the ledge, the others close on his heels. The flower hounds coursed swiftly upward, and their master swam easily below, watching. The ledge dropped. Harker shot along it like a deer. Beyond the lowest dip it plunged into the tunnel whence the river came. A short tunnel, and at the far end. Daylight, Harker shouted. Daylight. McLaren's bleeding leg gave out and he fell. Harker caught him. They were at the lowest part of the dip. The flower beasts were just below, rushing higher. McLaren's foot was swollen, the calf of his leg discolored. Some swift infection from the planty's claws. He fought Harker. Go on, he said. Go on. Harker slapped him hard across the temple. He started on, half carrying McLaren, but he saw it wasn't going to work. McLaren weighed more than he did. He thrust McLaren into Sim's powerful arms. The big black nodded and ran, carrying the half-conscious man like a child. Harker saw the first of the flower things flow up onto the ledge in front of them. Sim hurdled them. They were not large, and there were only three of them. They rushed to follow, and Harker speared them, slashing and striking with the sharp bone tip. Behind him the full tide rushed up. He ran, but they were faster. He drove them back with a spear and knife, and ran again, and turned and fought again, and by the time they had reached the tunnel, Harker was staggering with weariness. Sim stopped. He said, There's no way out. Harker glanced over his shoulder. The river fell sheer down a high face of rock, too high and with too much force in the water even for the giant water planties to think of attempting. Daylight poured through overhead, warm and welcoming, and it might as well have been on Mars. Dead end. Then Harker saw the little eroded channel twisting up at the side. Little more than a drain pipe, and long dry, leading to a passage beside the top of the falls. A crack, barely large enough for a small man to crawl through. It was a hell of a ragged hope, but... Harker pointed, between jabs at the swarming flowers. Sim yelled, You first! Because Harker was the best climber, he obeyed, helping the gasping McLaren up behind him. Sim wielded his spear like a lightning brand, guarding the rear, creeping up inch by inch. He reached a fairly secure perch and stopped. His huge chest pumped like a bellows. His arm rose and fell like a polished bar of ebony. Harker shouted to him to come on. He and McLaren were almost at the top. Sim laughed. How are you going to get me through that little bitty hole? Come on, you fool. You better hurry. I'm about finished. Sim, Sim, damn you. Crawl out through that tube, runt, and pull that string bean with you. I'm a man-sized man, and I got to stay. Then furiously, hurry up, or they'll drag you back before you're through. He was right. Harker knew he was right. He went to work pushing and jamming McLaren through the narrow opening. McLaren was groggy and not much help, but he was thin and small-boned, and he made it. He rolled out on a slope covered with green grass, the first Harker had seen since he was a child. He began to struggle after McLaren. He did not look back at Sim. The black man was singing about the glory of the coming of the Lord. Harker put his head back into the darkness of the creek. Sim! Yeah? Faintly hoarse, echoing. There's land here, Sim. Good land. Yeah? Sim, we'll find a way. Sim was singing again. The sound grew fainter, diminishing downward into distance. The words were lost, but not what lay behind them. Matt Harker buried his face in the green grass, and Sim's voice went with him into the dark.
the clouds were turning color with the sinking of the hidden sun. They hung like a canopy of hot gold washed in blood. It was utterly silent, except for the birds. Birds. You never heard birds like that down in the low places. Matt Harker rolled over and sat up slowly. He felt as though he had been beaten. There was a sickness in him, and a shame, and the old dark anger lying coiled and deadly above his heart. Before him lay the long slope of grass to the river, which bent away to the left out of sight behind a spur of granite. Beyond the slope was a broad plain and then a forest of gigantic trees. They seemed to float in the coppery haze, their dark branches outspread like wings and starred with flowers. The air was cool, with no taint of mud or rot. The grass was rich, the soil beneath it clean and sweet. Rory McLaren moaned softly, and Harker turned. His leg looked bad. He was in a sort of stupor, his skin flushed and dry. Harker swore softly, wondering what he was going to do. He looked back toward the plain, and he saw the girl. He didn't know how she got there, perhaps out of the bushes that grew in thick clumps on the slope. She could have been there a long time, watching. She was watching now, standing quite still about forty feet away. A great scarlet butterfly clung to her shoulder, moving its wings with lazy delight. She seemed more like a child than a woman. She was naked, small and slender and exquisite. Her hair had a faint translucent hint of green under its whiteness. Her hair, curled short to her head, was deep blue, and her eyes were blue also, and very strange. Harker stared at her, and she at him, neither of them moving. A bright bird swooped down and hovered by her lips for a moment, caressing her with its beak. She touched it and smiled, but she did not take her eyes from Harker. Harker got to his feet, slowly, easily. He said, Hello. She did not move, nor make a sound, but quite suddenly a pair of enormous birds, beaked and clawed like eagles and black as sin, made a whistling rush down past Harker's head and returned, circling. Harker sat down again. The girl's strange eyes moved from him, up toward the crack in the hillside whence he had come. Her lips didn't move, but her voice, or something, spoke clearly inside Harker's head. You came from there. There had a tremendous feeling in it, and none of it nice. Harker said, Yes, a telepath, huh? But you're not. A picture of the golden swimmers formed in Harker's mind. It was recognizable, but hatred and fear had washed out all the beauty, leaving only horror. Harker said, No. He explained about himself and McLaren. He told about Sim. He knew she was listening carefully to his mind, testing it for truth. He was not worried about what she would find. My friend is hurt, he said. We need food and shelter. For some time there was no answer. The girl was looking at Harker again. His face, the shape and texture of his body, his hair, and then his eyes. He had never been looked at quite that way before. He began to grin. A provocative, be damned to you grin that injected a surprising amount of light and charm into his sardonic personality. Honey, he said, you are terrific. Animal, mineral, or vegetable? She tipped her small round head in surprise and asked his own question right back. Harker laughed. She smiled, her mouth making a small inviting V, and her eyes had sparkles in them. Harker started toward her. Instantly, the birds warned him back. The girl laughed, a mischievous ripple of merriment. Come, she said, and turned away. Harker frowned. He leaned over and spoke to McLaren, with peculiar gentleness. 
He managed to get the boy erect, and then swung him across his shoulders, staggering slightly under the weight. McLaren said distinctly, I'll be back before he's born. Harker waited until the girl had started, keeping his distance. The two blackbirds followed watchfully. They walked out across the thick grass of the plain toward the trees. The sky was now the color of blood. A light breeze caught the girl's hair and played with it. Matt Harker saw that the short curled strands were broad and flat, like blue petals. End of Part 2